Begin a 30-day free trial at audible.com and experience our unmatched selection of audiobooks and original audio entertainment, including ad-free premium podcasts like Where Should We Begin with Esther Perel. Listen in as the foremost authority on modern love, Esther Perel, meets with real couples and their stories become your stories. Join Audible today and receive a free audiobook on us. You know, I've made a lot of money for a lot of people. You know, it's one thing if, if someone had some knowledge and was helping Bernie perpetrate the crime or doing something. And no time throughout this whole process, anybody did the right thing. Now, of course, you listen to them, they're all, they're living out of dumpsters and they're, uh, you know, they don't have any money and so on and so forth. And I'm sure it's a, it's a traumatic experience to some. All you have to do is get it to the Caymans and we can all commit, like, this is crazy. It's like a freak show. Back when Bernie Madoff was still running his racket, investors, funds, would reach out, stop by his lavish office, call him on the phone. They had questions for him. Well, they would, they would ask me that, you know, with a smile. Like, you know, somebody would say, you know, you're not, you're not a buyer, they said, which is a hedge fund that blew up, or you're not, or you're really doing these trades, or, you know, and so on and so forth. And sometimes I would say, no, I'm not. They would laugh and that would be, <laughs> they didn't want to believe it. They didn't want to believe it. And there you have it. Turns out Bernie had been confessing for years, or trying to. But actually, this moment, this is everything. The meetings between Madoff and the banks, the feeder funds, what happened? These are the very institutions that powered and profited from Madoff. They were the winners. And it led me to wonder, did they really want to know? Why should we believe that you're telling the truth now? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I have nothing to lose by telling the truth. Uh, and if, in fact, uh, the bank or the fund acted improperly, then you know, I feel it's my obligation basically to, uh, to say that. Upstanding citizen, Bernie Madoff? Okay, don't shed all your skepticism, but from where Bernie sat, he had a view unlike almost anyone else of the rig system. That was his edge. We'll hear more from Bernie later. My goal now, to understand the forces that turned a rickety Ponzi machine into the world's largest con. I set out on the final leg of my journey. Next stop, Greenwich Village. All right, here we go. In Manhattan, there's this little fast food joint. Uma Taqueria. Uma Temakaria. Oh, Temakaria. Uma Temakaria. This is the Brazilian-Japanese mashup. I stopped by with my producers for lunch. Sushi. In a burrito. Absolutely. Well, so Chopped then up we use and sashimi. to interview the entrepreneur who started this place, Cynthia Kippers. And did you, like five years ago, did you think that you would be starting restaurants in New York City? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. I have a finance background. I had uh, worked at a hedge fund uh, for a number of years investing in emerging markets. Uh, then I had gone to business school uh, at Yale. And when I came out of business school, I was actually on the sell side for a little bit, working at an investment bank uh, in industrials and transportation. For Cynthia, sushi burritos aren't a relaxing second act. They're a business opportunity. She's trying to create the next fast food chain. The restaurant world is competitive for sure, but for Cynthia, it offered an advantage. To her, it was transparent, not like the investment world. Back in 2006, Cynthia was working for a wealth management firm in San Francisco, Presidio, when she first heard about Bernie Madoff. I think some clients came to us and said, hey, we've heard about this fund. Uh, 
everybody's sort of talking about it, would you take a look at it? And so she did. She was impressed with how consistent the returns were, but she didn't understand it. If I can't understand it, I'm not someone that sort of says, well, if I can't get it, somebody else must be able to get it and I'm just not going to get there. You have to be able to understand all the way down to where something is coming from. You might have to do a little work to get there, but you should be able to understand what a certain driver is. Cynthia doesn't have direct contact with Madoff. She's dealing with Fairfield, the biggest of the Madoff feeder funds. So she makes a trip to New York City to meet with Fairfield and get more information. Uh, typically when I'm in New York, you can see, you know, five funds a day. Busy day. She does remember a few things from her visit to Fairfield's office. I remember it feeling a little bit claustrophobic uh, in that there were maybe four of us around a conference table. In a small room, huddled around a phone, connected to Bermuda, Fairfield's offshore headquarters. I believe Amit was on the phone from Bermuda. Amit Vijay Bergaya was Fairfield's chief risk officer, the person who is supposed to make sure Madoff is doing what he says he is doing. Cynthia asked question after question about the strategy. She doesn't need to know the secret sauce, but she needs to understand why it is so consistent if she's going to risk her client's money. And you don't always get information that's up to the minute with hedge fund managers, but they're pretty much always willing to give you back data. So you can say, I don't need data for the last two or three years, but give me something five years ago that I can look at that's stale data, it's not really telling me what your secret sauce is, but that I can parse that and understand how that return is generated. But Fairfield wouldn't give her anything. Red flag. They told her Amit had that information. And that he had done that work, but that he couldn't share it with us. He would go back to saying this is a unique strategy that we are in touch with Madoff and we review them on a regular basis, the strategy does shift. You got sort of very general types of answers. So he's, he's basically saying, trust me. Absolutely. Uh, so that right there is also a red flag. Then there was another red flag waving in the wind. Fairfield told Cynthia that Madoff's fund was closed. He wasn't accepting more investment. But Fairfield would be willing to sell some of its Madoff holdings to Cynthia's investors. Why would you sell me something that you're not going to sell anyone else? What makes me special? What makes me special? <laughs> and usually you're not special in this industry. It's, it's a money. It's, Did it's, you ask it's, that? Did he answer that? Uh, I, of course I asked that question. Why would you sell to us? Of course. Why? You're telling me that this fund is closed and you're going to give me your capacity? Why would you sell to us? Of course that's my question. That, to me, is where the really big red flag came in. They said they're at capacity, they're closed fund, but we like Presidio Financial Partners, and we like your client base. We're going to let you guys in, and we're going to sell some of our stake to let you guys in. To Cynthia, something smelled, well, fishy. In finance, nobody cares if anyone likes each other. It's, it's, it's finance. If you've got a good thing, you're not selling that to someone else. I mean, that's the end of the game. Cynthia advised against investing. I you know, very clearly wrote in my investment letter, this might be a greater fool's game. Was Fairfield playing her for the greater fool? This is just one person selling on to the next without really a layer of diligence. A layer of diligence, that's due diligence, making sure things are what they're supposed to be. Cynthia couldn't get close enough to see anything, to be sure of anything. So she walked away. Remember the guy on the phone in her meeting, Amit? Obviously, first of all, this conversation never took place, Amit. <laughs> okay? Yeah, of course. Okay. This is a recording of Amit on the phone with Bernie. It's a conversation obtained as evidence by Massachusetts authorities and used in a lawsuit against Fairfield. Bernie made this call because he was in a bind. He'd lied to the SEC and he was panicked. What would Fairfield say when the SEC called? You know, the less that you know, the better you are. You know, you, your position is saying, listen, Madoff has been in business for 45 years. You know, he's, you know, he's a well-known broker. You know, we make the assumption that he's, he's doing everything properly because what, this is the thing you, you also have to understand, that they, 
<clears throat> that you guys are not uh, are not part of the of the execution piece of this of of this uh, this strategy, and that's important. Of course, Cynthia says Fairfield told her something very different. According to her, on that call, they claimed they had all the answers. Because we don't discuss that with you. We, we've never discussed that with you, and we, we, we don't intend to. Madoff's lie? First, he told the SEC he didn't trade options as part of his strategy. Then, oops, he told them he did. You know, we had said that the options were part of the model years ago, but it is now not part of the model. Uh, Madoff tells Ahmet basically, don't worry about whether options are involved. Just tell them you don't know anything at all. You know, you don't have to be too brilliant with these guys because you, 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 you don't have to be, you're not supposed to have that knowledge. Who else had heard about Madoff and seen a big red flag? Options are traded like stocks. What had those traders heard? Back then, options were traded in the pit, down a few steps, like a giant swimming pool. And it's filled with traders. It's loud. You know, you get all these people, it sounds like a din. It's like, you know, a bunch of people yelling, and then you have to be able to get something out that sounds slightly different so people can hear you. So would you do something? Just talk higher or what? I'd scream. This screamer is Mark Cooper. He's a former options trader, has a ton of experience. Cooper had heard a lot about Madoff. It came up a lot with potential investors. At some point in the meeting, whether it was like on the handshakes, goodbye, they say, by the way, what do you hear about this Madoff fund? You know, like <laughs> everybody was asking about it. All this buzz about Madoff, it made him curious. We're in the market making business, we're in the trading business. If Madoff has some way of making money that we could understand and replicate, we would want to do it also. Translation? If Madoff has an edge, well, it's business. Cooper and company were there to make money. If they could, they'd rip off Bernie's strategy. So Cooper got his hands on one of Madoff's monthly statements. And it actually had the trades on the sheet. So we were very excited to see his transactions for a month to see if there was any kind of pattern or, any, or something that we could take a look at and say, oh, this makes sense, we want to do it also. Cooper poured over the statement. Trying to determine, um, does it make any sense? Does it, you know, is it possible that this volume traded that day in, at this price in that strike? And because the sheets showed that level of detail. Right away, he noticed odd things about Madoff's options trading. It doesn't really make any sense. He's only trading certain days. You see, on those days, Madoff was trading enormous quantities, according to the statement. That volume would have been tremendous to have occurred on just a couple of days a month. Um, you know, it would have tilted the pitch tremendously. The market works on supply and demand. If someone buys as many options as Madoff claimed to buy, prices skyrocket. For the volume we figured he'd have to do, prices would have changed dramatically, not even five or 10 percent, but like 30, 40, 50 percent, <laughs> really? maybe more. To Cooper, something does not compute. The volume isn't there. So this is like this just isn't happening the way it's being presented. Plus, if Madoff was trading billions of dollars worth of options, it should have been really easy to track down somebody, anybody he was trading with. If there's a buyer, there's a seller. If there's a seller, there's a buyer because these are contracts. It takes two people to make the contract. Right. In a 2012 deposition, Madoff said that if anyone had bothered to call around... I mean, there's maybe 20 dealers, theoretically. Now, if I was doing business with them, they probably would have said, I can't disclose that. But since I wasn't doing business with them, they would say no. Cooper did call his contacts in the options world, and guess what? Nobody seemed to be trading with Madoff. Taken together, one gigantic market-rocking volumes that didn't rock the market, and two, no counterparties. Cooper knew it didn't make sense. To me, it was, it was more the simple math of it. This doesn't make any sense. There's nothing here. During a meeting with investors, one of them turns to Cooper and his partners in kind of stage whispers. By the way, what do you guys, what do you think of Madoff? 
you know, we'd always start off with this double negative. Well, we don't want to call him a fraud or anything, but, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't typically call the chairman of the NASD a fraud, you know. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't want to be calling a high-level person on Wall Street who's very wealthy and manages billions of dollars or anything, right? So we're just... You know, we're just turning around and saying, if I were you, I'd take a look at the volume hard, try and figure out where the trades are done, talk to the counterparties. And then we'd give a little detail. Well, we had all these people in the pit, and we saw some people's trading sheets, and kind of the transactions didn't make sense against what our guys were trading in the pit, and we didn't see the kind of volume that would have been needed for him to be managing billions of dollars. Cooper, like Cynthia, was trying to look inside Madoff's operation to see how the sausage was made. He got deeper than Cynthia did. He got access to more information. He knew something was wrong. So here's the question that bugs me. For the people who got closest, like the funds, why didn't they do the simple arithmetic? And this is where my years of research and hundreds of interviews have left me. When the sign seems so obvious, why did those with power, the funds, turn a blind eye? Stay with me. More after this break. Saying you're hired is easy, but when it comes to finding the perfect candidate for the job, you're going to need a little help. At least I do. So I use ZipRecruiter to help me avoid crushing waves of resumes and job seekers. ZipRecruiter lets you post to over 100 job sites, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with a single click. That means no more juggling calls to the office or emails. You can screen candidates, rate them, and hire who you need fast. ZipRecruiter also finds candidates in any city and industry nationwide. All you do is post once and watch the qualified candidates roll in. And their friendly and human support staff is ready and willing to help with any issue. Posting your job in one place isn't enough to find the quality candidates. Right now, you can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash Ponzi. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Ponzi. So here's the question that bugs me. For the people who got closest, like the funds, why didn't they do the simple arithmetic? They had thousands of investors, billions of dollars. Javier Blakemar, the lawyer who sued Santander's optimal fund, he has a nickname for the funds. He calls them enablers. And the enablers were essentially these aggregators of funds, like optimal being one of them, who were earning commissions. And structurally, all they wanted to do was get retail investors or investors of any size to give them money that they could charge a commission on, give it to Madoff, and the structure itself created the incentive to look the other way. And all of a sudden, you have this local swindler with a massive distribution network. Javier's lawsuit got tossed out on a technicality. But before that happened, he got access to information deep inside the optimal operation. My producer, Kelly Prime, and I were slack-jawed at what he found. Javier read us an email about Madoff, written by an optimal employee, the day after his meeting with that pit screamer, Cooper. It says, Suppose this was the largest Ponzi scheme in history, and palatable, but we're not the first to suggest it. That is remarkable. Holy shit, they called it. So they called it. And so the question is, you, you can have all kinds of discussions. The point I come back to is, why didn't you disclose exactly this to your investors? And the, the facts are, that Optimal nor Santander chose to disclose the doubts they had. And the doubts were dead on. The doubts were I got to the end of the alley and it is a blind alley. The idea of a Ponzi scheme crossed their minds, but that email goes on to say, quote, even in a worst case, this scenario is more than a little unlikely, unquote. Optimal walked right past it. The email went on to raise more questions and ends by saying they should keep raising these questions, quote, given the size and significance to our business, unquote. Madoff was very significant to their business. Optimal was a $3 billion fund, and they got a cut of every dollar they passed along. 
Humor me, let's follow the stench just a few more steps. During the short-lived class action suit, Javier took the deposition of Rajiv Jaitley. Jaitley is an Indian national based in England. He's straight-laced proper. He uses words like chap and bailiwick. But in his way, he's a badass. I like to think of him as a pro wrestler known as the hassle factor. Uh, well, l l let me try and explain it this way. If you've got a $100 uh, to give to a manager, and I've got a $100 to give to a manager, um, I'm the one who's going to be asking lots of difficult questions, and you're not going to be asking any. And he has only got $100 worth of capacity to take from any investor. Which investor is he going to take? Well, the chances are he'll take you because you're going to be less hassle for him. I was, in effect, the hassle factor. The hassle factor had created a top-notch due diligence operation at another fund. Jaitley thought he'd been hired to make the optimal due diligence team top-notch, too. It was an exciting prospect. My direct report was to Manuel Echevarria as the CEO. But right off the bat, there's a conflict. Uh, Madoff was not actually part of my bailiwick. I basically said, no, um, you know, this is something that I did need to look at. I, I think it's important to understand context here. I quite agree. Context is everything. According to Jaitley, he thought his boss, Manuel Echevarria, didn't want the hassle factor rocking the boat. I think he was concerned that um, I would spoil a very good relationship. And why do you believe that he thought you may spoil a very good relationship? Well, I think probably the best way of um, describing that is with the instructions that I was given prior to the meeting that I had in February 2006 with Madoff. Um, Manuel had a pre-meeting with Madoff to explain to him that I was going to be coming along to ask questions. Um, I was also given instructions because I was going to be chaperoned at that meeting and that uh, if they determined that I shouldn't push on a particular question, then I needed to shut up. But the hassle factor was there to get answers. And once he got in the ring, he was relentless. So the real value of a, of a due diligence meeting is really to do what I refer to as a walkthrough test, which is you go and you choose a particular investment off the trading book or the blotter, and then you follow it all the way through. Jaitley wanted to see a trade, just one trade, from beginning to end. And you can sort of see how it's entered into the system, how it might have appeared on the statements, you know, from the brokers, and so on. And I was just told that uh, that just simply wasn't going to happen, um, and I shouldn't raise it. Before Jaitley knew it, his only meeting with Madoff was over. And he was sent off to do his job, to write up a due diligence report. But Jaitley didn't feel he had enough information to work with. They were saying, sort of, where are, where are all these reports that you need, you know, that you should have produced by now? I think they were more concerned about having reports there that uh, they could then produce to clients. And I was more concerned about the substance of what we'd actually done. Which wasn't a whole lot in Jaitley's view. But all right, Jaitley came up with a workaround. He asked his colleagues on the investment side to verify the trades. You know, at least one. When I then rang up to sort of see how it was going, he said, oh, no, 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 we haven't done that. What? Jaitley asked him why they hadn't done it. And he said, look, Rajiv, you know, we all know you're a difficult guy. Um, you know, we had to calm you down at, the t at that particular point, so we agreed to it. Uh, but, you know, there's really no need to do it. We're all over this. We understand the investment strategy. Um, you know, it doesn't need this. So, Jaitley wrote up his concerns, but... According to Jaitley, that wasn't the kind of report his bosses wanted. His bosses told a junior investment analyst to draft a new report. To Jaitley, this was an insult. The, the publication of that report, uh, to a large extent, was what started uh, my decision process to leave Optimal. That junior analyst said he was in touch with Fairfield, who said that they told him that they had been able to verify a trade. Never mind that Fairfield said that was more than a decade ago. The junior analyst wrote up his report. Uh, the report at its very beginning says that um, their view was that Madoff was a well-run and efficient organization, to which my response was on what basis. 
um, you know, what evidence do we have for it? Um, so he was expressing a view, mm -hmm. saying that Madoff's security is suffering or committing an irregularity is possible but remote. I was again saying, well, on, you know, on what basis? And what I was saying is, well, what we've done is we've identified certain risks, so we need to make sure that investors are aware of what those risks are. I mean, if you tell your investor that, you know, you're investing blind, then, you know, it's up to the investor to make that decision, so long as it's disclosed. He brought it up with his boss, Manuel Echeverria. Well, I think, I think Manuel's approach to most things when there was uh, antagonism of this sort was to say, oh, well, you know, well, let's, let's get it down, we can read it and then have a look at it later. So he would, he would try and smooth things through. Um, he was always, you know, he, he didn't really want uh, conflict. In many ways, you know, I think that was the problem with, with Optimal. They were just very nice people who didn't want to upset others. Uh, the reason I resigned was because I felt that <coughs> Optimal weren't serious about risk. And so I decided it was appropriate for me to leave. So the hassle factor quit. And Optimal left its $3 billion with Madoff. So what would happen if uh, Optimal withdrew the money that was invested with you? Well, they would lose spend? that thing. I mean, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what uh, Manuel's salary or what his cut was, uh, but <clears throat> I think Optimal was on a sort of a one and a half percent, but one and a half percent of a lot is a lot. Of course, Optimal didn't withdraw its money and lost everything. Echeverria was charged with criminal mismanagement and unjust enrichment in Switzerland. The judge considered Jaitley's story, but decided that Madoff had such a sophisticated fraud, Echeverria could not have been expected to uncover it. She found him not guilty. After the ruling, Echeverria's lawyer crowed. The decision gives Echeverria back his dignity, honesty, and integrity, and he's glad he's been recognized as a victim. What do you think of that? I think it's a tragedy. Attorney Javier Blackmore again. He had all the indications that Madoff was a fraud without being able to prove it, and he looked the other way. I don't know how you keep your dignity when that is the case. It feels counterintuitive, but it is true. Optimal and Echeverria, they didn't violate any laws. This isn't abnormal, illegal, incorrect. It is exactly what is required of funds. That's all. A spokesperson for Santander, Optimal's parent bank, sent me this statement. Optimal Investment Services acted diligently and used all appropriate measures in accordance with industry standards to supervise its investments in Madoff securities. So what happened to the investors? Well, the bank stepped up right away and offered them a deal. Not all of them took it, Folks like Javier's class action participants didn't. But the vast majority did, like over 90%. And the bank settled with the trustee. The upshot? The investors are still waiting to see how it all turns out. But Optimal was only one of many funds. It wasn't even the biggest. The biggest fund was Fairfield, the fund that Uma Tamakaria's Cynthia met with. Fairfield took a commission on every dollar they passed on to Madoff, and they passed on $7 billion, according to Bernie. I look, uh, Fairfield, for example, made, you know, over $100 million a year from the, for their managers. Fairfield didn't admit any wrongdoing. They settled a fraud suit with Massachusetts authorities, and Amit was not criminally charged. In other words, Fairfield and Amit Vijay Vergaya, they didn't break the rules. A lawyer for Amit told me that Amit did his job well. That job was limited to making sure the trades reported by Madoff were within the parameters agreed upon years before. He also told me that Amit's reaction on hearing that Madoff was a fraudster was, quote, complete and utter shock and disbelief, unquote. And so we've got one more stop on this mystery tour. I'd started with Bernie went inside his operation where his unflappable crew made it all seem real, or real enough for the SEC. I'd examine how Bernie's meltdown wreaked havoc with victims' lives. That had led me to the funds and the banks, the vast financial network that took that local swindler 
around the world. And that's where this story changed for me. Yes, Madoff was patient zero, but it was the banks, the funds, which transformed him into a pandemic. They marketed him around the world. Their promise? To safeguard their clients' money. But to me, they seemed to ignore the warnings. To me, it didn't seem fair. Like a lot of the public, I wanted some answers, at least a chance to ask questions. I sat down with U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, Preet Bharara. About those feeder funds. It was as if Madoff was saying to these funds, um, here's $100 million, let's just keep this quiet. Now, okay, he didn't really say that, but he kind of did. Do you see that? If the question is, was there a lot of sleazy, self-interested conduct over the course of years so that people could make a lot of money and not have to ferret out the truth and not upset the apple cart or slay the golden goose or whatever other metaphor is appropriate to use, then the answer is yes. Yeah, it stinks. I pressed him. Why haven't we seen more prosecutions of fund managers, folks who poured gasoline on this dumpster fire? Why hadn't the U.S. attorney rounded up the lot of them, these savvy professionals who managed to hold their hands out while tucking their heads into the sand? Prosecution is a blunt tool. Uh, Criminal prosecution in this country is hard. It's supposed to be hard. Uh, The Founding Fathers made it hard. And you have to prove a crime, particularly a crime in which you have to show that what was going on in the person's mind was corrupt and they had intent to do something and knowledge about something. Uh, beyond a reasonable doubt to a unanimous jury from the general public. And it's not always possible if you don't have a cooperating witness uh, or you don't have the statute available or you don't have a recording to prove that somebody committed a crime, you don't have the evidence to do so. So that's an unsatisfactory answer. But we're limited by what the law allows and what the facts show. Yeah, I, I get it. The bar is high. But Preet Bharara tells me that in this case... He did get the bad guys. The 15 people that we have proved criminally in a court of law, either at trial or through guilty plea, um, that they had some responsibility for this fraud. Uh, but my m- question, most of whom have gone to jail. He's referring to Madoff's back office people, folks like Frank Pascali, and the one man in charge of the one man accounting firm working out of a strip mall. I mean, um, 15 people were and five, five of the Madoff uh, employees went to, went to prison. I mean, in a way, they're low-hanging fruit. I mean, they left notebooks, they had high school diplomas. To the outside, it looks like nobody who has a savvy financial history, nobody who's experienced in the financial services industry, nobody with an MBA goes to, to jail in the Madoff case. I mean. Why weren't the people at the hedge funds held accountable? You hold accountable criminally. People who you can prove had knowledge and violated the law beyond a reasonable doubt in front of a jury. And we prosecuted all the people uh, so far that we were able to prosecute. And so we are left with only Madoff and his back office crew locked up. And for the rest of the financial system, business as usual. I think... What people don't recognize is the fact that Madoff was, to a very large extent, part of the fabric of the financial community. This is David Sheehan, head honcho of the cleanup crew, tasked with recovering money for victims. The financial community would like you to think he's an outlier, that that he stands outside, that he was an aberration, that can never happen again, and we're going to protect you against all that. None of that is true, right? And the reason I say it's part of the fabric is that What happened with Madoff as he got bigger and bigger, and he needed more and more cash, because that's, you know, the mother's milk of a Ponzi scheme is cash. So he has to go out and get more of it, creates bigger and bigger funds, get more and more colleagues all bringing money in. The thing is this, I I don't want to overstate who Bernie was, all right? I, I certainly don't think he was any genius, mathematically or otherwise. He certainly wasn't a computer genius. He was none of those things, all right? Uh, what he was, though, was someone who took advantage of a brokerage system in this country that if someone wants to pervert it, as he did, and make it into a Ponzi scheme, they can. 
Bernie couldn't agree more. Every aspect of this business, from the regulatory side to the operational side to the marketing side, uh, it's, uh, it's a total disaster. Let's end where we began, with Bernie Madoff, the Ponzi supernova who burned so brightly for a time. For 50 years, I operated at every level of this industry and was witness to all the rules and regulations. I was on the committees that built them. Uh, I served on the Federal Regulation Committee, which includes the general counsels of every firm, primary firm on Wall Street, and uh, for longer than any body in the industry. And I watched general counsels of the major firms acknowledge that their firms were violating the rules left and right, the CEOs knew what was going on. So none of this makes me feel any better, okay? Uh, and it's probably not gonna make anybody else feel any better. But uh, it's, 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 a, it's pathetic, but that's what is, that's what is going on. And uh, it's something that I knew all along uh, and maybe had a greater impact on my psyche than I thought that allowed me to, uh, to do this. But as to whether or not to believe me or not, you know, <laughs> I, I have no axe to grind, you know, one way or the other, other than do the right thing. Uh, I don't know if I'm not sure what is the right thing any longer, but I feel that at this stage of the game, it's, it's what I want to do. Thanks to our reporters for Latin American victims, Martina Castro, Pablo Mueller, and Ser Quevado, and translator Philip Kay. And thanks to our reporter for U.S. victims, Jane Cohen. Special thanks to Daniel Sanit, Dan Laidman, Kathleen Brady, and Amanda Remus. A very special thanks to the whole Audible Originals team, Eric Newsom, Jesse Baker, Vanessa Harris, Olivia Natt, Norman Prott, and Beverly C. Ponzi Supernova is an Audible Originals production. Our production team is Kelly Prime and Todd Whitney, with help from Jane Cohen. Hosted by Steve Fishman and produced by Ellen Horn. Colin Campbell is our editor. Our score was created by Darren Gray, Mike Cruz, and Glenn Kochi. Our audio was mixed by Mike Cruz. For more information, go to ponzisupernova.com. This is Audible.